Welcome to the Parasite Podcast, a show about me and you. We are Venom. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Parasite Podcast. And today I'm actually with someone who's been in my comment section quite a bit. He's also uh, reached out to me on Twitter a couple times, has a YouTube channel for himself and also T Public that makes t-shirt designs and stuff. And I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about that here. This is Julian. Julian, say hey to everyone and let them know what sites you're on and where they can find you. Hello, everyone. Uh, first, I'm happy to be here, Seek. Yeah, it's wonderful to actually be talking to you, finally. And uh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter at IamFozitude. It's F-O-Z-Z-I-T-U-D-E. Um, but I know you know all the links for that is going to be you know available once this you know, is uploaded for everybody to check it out. And the, my show is the Men and Tides podcast, and I uh, have talk about a variety of things on there and i try not to be too specific with what i do on there and uh like you said i do have a, a t public uh, store that has all kinds of you know fun designs that most of them i came up with myself others i've had help with but yeah nice. <laughs> a lot of fun stuff on there yeah, you guys should check it out. I'll, like he said, I'll put links down below in the description box to his T Public account, so you can check out his T-shirts. Pick, uh, feel free to pick one up. Uh, he's got some really fun stuff on there, especially if you're a Snyder fan. He's got a lot of funny quotes from Snyder and, and uh, you know, and everything for from Zack Snyder. Um, but then also, yeah, your YouTube channel, you cover you know everything. You like wrestling, comic books. Like there's a, quite a variety on there, um, filmmaking, everything. And I really dig that about it. It's like it's uh, it's it's very much uh, everything that it kind of revolves around men in tights in a way too, which is kind of fun. Um, and, uh, yeah. And, and so let's kind of start there. Um, you know, like where, where did the love for all these things, like how long have you been like a wrestling fan, a comic fan, a movie fan? Like, I'm just curious where your entry point was for each of those fandoms. Well, I would probably say it's pretty much as far back as I can remember to probably around maybe two years old, as far as I can remember, most of this stuff, I got into it through my oldest brother and from my father, cause they, my oldest brother, especially, he was the one that introduced me to comic books. He used to have all several, so many dresser drawers full of uh, old Marvel and DC comic books that I would just look at just because you know, I was too young to understand what was going on. I would just look at the pictures and think, oh, these are cool. You know, let me look at these. And, you know, and also because of how young and not you know, really developed I, at the time, I ended up messing up a lot of those comics. So he's he was a little <laughs> mad at me for that. But, you know, we've since patched things up, so of course. Um <laughs> And like with same with wrestling, like my my father and my brother, we've pretty much everything about who I am, especially now as an adult, I inherited from my oldest brother and from my father. That's awesome, yeah, and and that's it's great. It's it's funny because like for me, comics didn't really come from family. Like my mom bought me my first comics, but I don't I don't come from a family that read comics. Um, and but I did come from a family that watched wrestling. So when I was growing up in the '80s and '90s, uh, I was definitely very much uh, aware of everything that was happening in wrestling and stuff. So for you, like, do you have some favorite wrestlers, like past uh, wrestlers and current wrestlers? Uh, yeah, I have a lot of favorites, that, but. Sometimes, well, at least like the current, with the current state of wrestling, but it varies depending on how I'm feeling for the day. But like my all-time favorite wrestler would be a uh, Bret Hart, uh, if, you know, if, if you remember him. Oh yeah, man, he passed away though, right? Uh, no, no, that was the the brother Owen oh, Hart. He's oh, the one that Owen had, the, had the accident. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, he's the one that had the. Yeah, the accident uh, at the Kemper Arena in Kansas City. I oh, think it was Kansas City. Bret, he was called the Hitman, right? Hitman Hart. Yeah, yeah. He, 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 was, he had the the pink sunglasses. I actually had them on display behind me. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's right. Yes, uh, awesome. Uh, and so he was. He's your favorite wrestler. And so what what was it about him that really kind of pulled you in? Yes, rest in peace, Owen. By the way, Owen was a, also a tremendous athlete, if I remember correctly. Yes, he was. Um, but with, with Bret Hart, uh, I don't know exactly what it was that drew me to him. I guess like when I was younger and didn't really understand all the, you know. You know, like of course, you know, like when like little kids from at least when I was a little kid, I would always get made fun of for liking wrestling because it's it's fake and all that stuff. But uh, you know, I, I at the time I didn't really know or care about any of that. But I guess with Bret Hart, what stood out to me is of course his outfit that he, you know, a masculine man wearing proudly wearing pink, and that's that wasn't very common back then. And so that was something that really stood out to me. And you know, and I don't wear a lot of pink now, but I have no 
has hesitance to probably show it off but um <laughs> and also just especially like now after reading his his biography that came out a little over a decade ago that you know seeing how he's always been someone that stuck to his principles instead of for what he believes in you know that's something that i that i really admire and consider him one of my heroes in addition to like my father who was you know my ultimate hero for everything that you know that i am as a human being but you know bret hart standing up for everything he believes in you know no matter the cost of himself personally and professionally something that i've always admired that's awesome that's it's nice to hear you talk about your dad like that because uh um, you know, it is a lot of times like, like for me, it was my grandfather and my mom have been that kind of influence on me. So what is it about your dad? Like, what are some of the traits about your dad that you admire the most and, and things that you maybe try to emulate in, in yourself? One thing that, uh, especially in recent years that I've really come to know respect and appreciate that he's always put family first before himself huh. and, not, and not even just family just anybody that you know was might have been going through a hard time and they needed some help he always you know he wouldn't hesitate to help anybody out and uh, that he was always happy to help essentially anybody that needed even the smallest thing like the way my brother would describe it that if he if he had a dollar in his pocket he would give you 99 cents of it that's uh he sounds like a good dude man and that and that i guess yeah that does it helps shape you as a as a man and as a person because you're like hey this guy yeah if he would give you 99 cents out of your out of his dollar out of his pocket um that says that's actually is a great summary of the guy it sounds like he's really awesome i'm glad he had such an impact on you man yeah he had a lot of influence on me in in a lot of ways yeah that's great and and so you said also comic books and stuff like that came from him, your brother, or and, and your brother mostly, and your brother had a big drawer full of them, which is funny because when I was a kid, I didn't have comic book boxes, so I would shove mine in my drawer too uh, to keep them safe. Uh, so that's kind of funny. And uh, and I too had a little brother and who would sometimes uh, bend my comic books. Uh, so what what were some of your favorite books that your brother had that, um, you know, kind of your early introduction into characters? Like who were some of the first ones you came across? Well, some, some of the ones that I can remember the most i don't remember the story specifically i just i remember the the covers yep. mainly the like he had a lot of silver surfer okay comic books um i don't remember specifically like just the image of him you know a, the silver godlike being you know surfing through space you know <laughs> at such a young and impressionable age you know i was obviously drawn to something like that and he also had a lot of the the amazing spider-man comic books from the late 80s and early 90s and that's actually how like i think it was how I first got introduced to the Venom character, especially, uh, was through uh, I think it was Amazing Spider-Man issues three forty-six and forty-seven. Okay. And uh, but for those, those are also the ones that it was the the covers that drew me in because I think three forty-six was the one where it's just a close-up of his face and you see the reflection of Spider-Man in in the in his his eyes. Right. And then four and then three forty-seven is the picture of him holding the skull with the torn Spider-Man mask, you know, like like Hamlet. So. Oh and yeah. I think. I, and I think that's the one that actually stood out the most to me that actually I think I was in third grade at the time and actually tried to sketch that that same comic comic book cover for myself to show it off to my teacher but I don't remember if the, t if the teacher actually liked it or not <laughs> you're like look it's Hamlet via Spider-Man and Venom <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's great yeah and the teacher's like get out um, <laughs> no, that's uh, that's cool, and that's great to hear you talk about Venom. Obviously, I mean, like that's my kind of whole show is about is Venom, and I see you pop up in the comments from the time to time. But if I'm not mistaken, you and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I, did you find me or come across me through Dave the Film Junkie? Uh, yeah, I can't remember if it was when when you like when you did the podcast with him or when you when you were on one of his vodka streams. It was it was one of those that okay. you know hearing you two go back and forth those you know just like ah, oh, this this sea guy sounds pretty cool i'll check out, i'll check out his channel that was well that's very nice of you uh yeah dave dave we had him on the show obviously as you know i think you watched that episode and commented and he's he's a great guy i mean I, i've known him now for years we only met one time in person it was literally three days before i left california uh, like after all that time we never actually met face to face we were in the same areas three or four times but never could meet up and uh and so yeah. it, it was so cool to actually sit and have lunch with him and talk to him for like three hours about comic books and movies and you know you know everything like you know and it was he's a really nice guy and he was nice to have me on his show um 
and you know, and that brings me to, I guess, like the fandom of the Snyder Cut stuff. Like you, I've seen video, you know, posts about from you, and also videos on your YouTube channel where you've come out and said that uh, Zack Snyder is your favorite film director. So if we can kind of yes. we can start there. Like, what movies of his, you know, are among your favorite, and what is it about his style that really draws you in? Well, the funny thing, like, with my love of the Zack Snyder movies is that, like, I had seen so, all of his movies uh, right right up until Man of Steel, and before Man of Steel, I didn't even know that it was the same guy directing all those movies. <laughs> I just knew that I really loved those movies. Yeah. And then when my friend my friend told me that uh, he was doing a Superman movie, it was, like, around, like, late 2011 when, when she told me, and I was, and when I looked it up, I was like, wait, this, the guy that directed Watchmen is directing Superman? And she was like, "Yeah, that's that's him." I was just like, oh, "Hell yeah, I'm I'm in for that opening day." But fortunately, I was not able to go opening day. I had to work, but I eventually, you know, did get to see Man of Steel. And as of right now, it is still my favorite Zack Snyder movie. Okay. And but the, the, what what really what makes Zack Snyder my favorite director is that no matter what the story is and the characters that he has in his movies, I'm I, I'm able to feel emotionally invested in the stories of each character regardless of how significant or insignificant that they might be to the story and i'm like even the the, the animated owl movie the, the that that one i felt emotionally invested in those characters and you know was worried about whatever was going to happen to them and and that's just and that's probably his i think least known film because most people know him for of course Watchmen and the uh, man of steel and batman v superman and uh 300 and the his dawn of the dead remake and all the controversy that people like to throw out for his sucker punch movie uh, <laughs> but yeah like i all of his movies i don't know how i would rank them as my favorites but for sure man of steel is my favorite but that's part of that is also because superman is my favorite comic book character out of out of all of dc and marvel wow. so that one stands out to me the most and also because superman was the first character i was ever introduced to by my father through the christopher reeve movies so that's you know that that always holds a special place for me that's amazing it's always uh, i always find that some of my favorite people and friends i've ever made when they tell me it's always because they tell me Superman is their favorite superhero. Uh, like, like hearing you say that, it just it says a lot about you. Um, I, that's how I feel when it, people mention Superman. My friend Todd, he was my best friend uh, for years, and we still keep in touch. Um, but we used to be roommates in California, and his favorite superhero of all time was Superman. He would only ever want to talk about Superman when it came to comics, and. Uh, and I and we watched Smallville together and everything like we were big fans and so uh, so but that to me summarizes when someone says oh I'm a big Superman fan he's my favorite that's completely makes me like you ten times even more than I already did Julian um, and uh, and hearing that too about your perspective on Snyder like I mean I too I've I, you know watched a lot of his movies I, you know he started off doing commercials and uh, like and a, a couple of them were car commercials and stuff and yeah when I'm Dawn of the Dead is my favorite zombie movie of all time I'm actually a big zombie fan i grew up outside of pittsburgh where romero george romero made all of his movies um nice. and when they were remaking that i was like f this movie there's no way i'm gonna like this movie and then when i watched it not only did i like it but then it made me take note of Zack snyder so because of my love for his dawn of the dead and the fact that he made me put my foot in my mouth even if i've been critical of his movies or not i watch every single one of his movies because of how good he did dawn of the dead <laughs> Yeah, um, and Guardians of Gohul. I'm glad you mentioned that because yeah, most people don't even know that's one of his movies, but that is actually a really good movie. Yeah, I, I actually, I think I saw that one opening day, and I I watched it in 3D because I wanted to get the full experience, especially after seeing the uh, because I saw the the first poster where you know with the where it's all blue sailing through the like the snowy water whatever mm -hmm. like droplets thing uh, it's, it's been a it's been a little while since i've seen the movies like so i i know the visuals but i can't remember that everything exactly that happens but uh just the, that poster and then that first trailer where they showed the slow motion flying in the air with the eyes closed and all that just drew me in and then when i saw that in theaters uh i'd taken my wife at the time and you know that's a story i'd you know i'll tell another time but, okay. but uh uh, when we went to go see it, it was I was just so amazed that a story a su story that you know most would consider so simple was done so in such a beautiful way that I don't know how many other directors would have done. 
I mean, it's true. He the stuff he brings visually to his uh, to his work is it's always di- it, dis- very distinct. Like when I see a trailer of one of his movies, I, I can instantly go, oh, that's a Zack Snyder movie. Um, yeah. You know, he has a, a certain color palette, a certain tone, um, certain visuals. Like you brought up Sucker Punch. What's so funny about that movie is uh, I remember, vaguely remember, seeing that movie opening weekend in the theater. And I remember being the only person in my group when we walked out that liked it. Same with Watchmen. I was the only person. I went with like six or seven people to both of those movies. And both those movies that came out, and I was the only person who enjoyed either one of them. And people would, you know, always ask me, why do you like Sucker Punch? Why do you like Sucker Punch? And I said, and they're like, you know, they bring up the controversy of it. Oh, it puts women down. It puts these down. I go, well, I mean, I, I sure that can be interpreted one way. I think that's Zach's whole point is that his movies can be interpreted different ways. But for me, I was just like, well, I, the way I looked at that movie is it was the first time I saw a story successfully use um, violence as a metaphor for sex. Um, and, it's, uh, and I and I maybe it's because I'm such a Silent Hill fan and a fan of Masahiro Ito and his work about blending sexuality and horror and stuff uh, and and violence. Like maybe it's because I'm aware of that that I, I I made me appreciate what what Snyder was trying to do in that movie. So for you, like, what is it about Sucker Punch that kind of stood out to you and made you kind of shy away from the controversy and enjoy it as a as the movie it is? Uh, well, because. And it's funny because with Sucker Punch, it was the, this was the only Zack Snyder movie that up until this year I had not seen. Ah. And that was mainly because because the the movie theaters where I lived didn't weren't showing it, and I hadn't been able to find uh, the, the DVD or Blu-rays for it. And eventually, uh, when the, the the his Justice League movie was announced on on May twentieth, I went on Amazon and bought all of the all of his movies that I didn't already have, so that I'd be able to ha- have the whole collection. And then, like, it arrived, I think, three or four days later, and I had, like, a whole week-long marathon watching those movies. Cool. And when I finally got to watch Sucker Punch, um, I mean, I, I would expect it to like it, because, like I said, I, you know, Zack Snyder is one of those few directors that has not disappointed me with anything he's done. Mm-hmm. And plus, a lot of the actors in the movies uh, are people that I'm a fan of, like Jenna Malone and yeah. uh, Oscar Isaac, Carla Gugino. I've, you know, been a fan of all of them for years. Mm-hmm. And getting to see... The story, and especially knowing all the controversy with people saying like, "Oh, it's it, you know, it, it's misogynist and sexist and all that other, all those other trigger words that they, they like to throw out there," <laughs> and and just because, and then but, but once I finished seeing it, and just in my head, I was just thinking, these people that said all those things, they were judging it on the surface level rather than looking at what the story was actually trying to tell, and like you said, it was you know like. It was, you know, it was violence, you know, and it was basically showing violence as like a metaphor for sex, like you said. But right. I, I, I looked at it as just, you know, that, and also that showing that through everything that these girls were being put through, and the things that they were being forced to do, uh, essentially against their will for the most part, that, you know, that they were showing that they are stronger and more than what uh, what they are told that they are supposed to be. And and even I even saw an interview that uh, Jenna Malone had done talking about the, the movie, and she was saying that she was so happy that she got to be such a, a badass character while while looking sexy at the same time. And I feel like not, a lot, not enough people appreciate that part of it either, that it's, like, it's okay to look like that while also still being a kick-ass, you know, warrior type of character. <laughs> I mean, it's true. I mean, we do live in a, di- it's a very different time now where people, uh, you know, especially even people in comics who make comic books and draw comic books, they'll even purposely, um, you know, make women less sexy or less a sex appealing, I should say, um, you know, f- you know, just because of the time, you know, we live in and because of their personal feelings and stuff. And, and that's fine. Like I'm all, that's always been a thing. There's always been in comics, like when they, someone who sees Vampirilla and they go, Oh, we got to let's redraw Vampirilla and cover up her boobs a little bit more. And then there'd be other artists who like, well, actually I want to show more of her boobs. And so to me, there's room for both interpretations um, because there's, because there's fans of both interpretations. So to say, say one is right and one is wrong. I feel is, is like, well, that's not the point of the character. The point of the character is that there's, someone in the character for everyone and everyone whether they're uh, you know borderline perverted or not or whether they just think it's sexy like you know it doesn't matter like uh like i remember one of the uh the comic book characters i had a crush on when i was a kid was she hulk 
Um, and She Hulk was she was built. She was very toned and built, um, and 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 you know and had a, like a, a nice physique. Bent depending on the artist that do her. Usually John Byrne, I think, was the artist when I was a kid. And but I was like, oh, she's still super pretty. I mean, she's even though she's muscular and stuff, she's still super pretty. Nowadays, she looks like a, like a literally a sideways tank. Like you're just like, oh wow, I, I, I don't I can't even see a figure in there. Um, but we do we do live in different times, and so with Sucker Punch, like. For me, when I mean like, you know, because some people I know will ask, like, what do you mean it uses me uh, violence from uh, metaphor for sex? Those scenes where, sh where Baby Doll, right, is it her character? Um, yeah. She has to... She has to dance uh, erotically for for a guy to distract them or whatever, and apparently her dance is so good and so erotic that it puts them in a hypnotist state so the other girls can, like, you know, take the keys off the guy or whatever they got to do, they got to distract them. And instead of showing her you know be naked and, and take her clothes off instead of sh showing that which a lot of filmmakers probably would have just done that zach instead was like hey let's add this fantasy element where she goes in her head and she's not actually being a a, a an, um you know a sex item for this guy she's actually going out as a samurai and she's fighting giant robots you know or she's you know and i, I so so again yeah he's using meta he's using violent metaphors where they're in their heads fighting these different robots and things instead of showing the actual nudity and stuff and to me i just haven't seen a movie really do that uh successfully and i think that's where i give him credit for that movie um but i'm glad you watched it that sounds like a great week you had where you just kind of kind of sat down and watched through all those movies what what at the end of that week how did you feel watching all that stuff back to back oh well i felt exhausted because it was you know <laughs> watching all those one after the other like that especially because you know some, how he with the exception of uh, the you know, Owls of Gahul, that he he doesn't do short movies, so right, uh, it was you know it was exhausting, but a good kind of exhausting because, like I said, I love all of his movies and and especially you know get any any excuse to get to watch Watchmen and Man of Steel again is you know always good for me, uh, especially because yeah, because I when he announced the the Justice League movie, that's when he was doing the the commentary for Man of Steel, and then. You know, of course, I watched it that day, and then watching it again a week later for my own little, you know, private marathon. You know, it's always it's always a fun experience for me, and it's you know just I well I don't like that I have to wait a whole year for for his Justice League movie. Um, it's it'll be worth the wait for sure. Well, I was gonna say you may not like waiting a whole year, but but the fact that you do know you're gonna get it next year is uh is amazing because you've been waiting technically three years for it and didn't even know if it was actually going to come out um yeah yeah so that's that must feel nice though knowing like uh you know that 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 reward so i i did ask you know um you know dave film junkie this so i'll ask you you know how involved because i see you make the shirts and you made some videos and stuff so how involved were you with the release of snyder cut movement and uh and how ecstatic are you now knowing that yeah it's a year away but you're definitely getting the movie that you've been fighting for well, I've, I, th I would say, you know, my level of excitement is not really easy to put into words. But, okay. uh, I, what I remember most about that day, uh, that after his announcement, like in the hours that came afterwards, I got a lot of me messages on Facebook and Twitter and text messages from friends who are might not be fans of Zack Snyder, but all of them like you know, telling me like, oh, you must be so happy that you're fi you're finally getting the movie and all these other things. It's like because they knew, you know, how deep I was into it and like my oldest brother he was you know he while he wasn't actively involved with the campaigning he was still very much behind it because he is a big Zack Snyder fan as well and with my my involvement it's well for about maybe like a year and a half I had kind of like a love-hate relationship with my involvement with it because of a lot of the drama with in, with certain people involved in the whole thing sure but I would I would anytime there was like a big campaign, like especially the one that was on November seventeenth of last year, I was very, very, very active. You know, essentially from the moment I woke up until you know I went to bed that night, try, trying to tweet at least you know two or three times every hour to try to get the analytics and the the trending, you know, as much as possible. Which of course, you know, obviously it it helped a lot because here we are, you know. Was two months now after the announcement, so yeah. you know, obviously it, it made a big difference. 
No kidding. No, it really did. I've never, and I told this to Dave. I, you know, I've never seen a fandom go to the levels that the release of Snyder Cuts is. And I know people have this negative stigma, like about, and that's what I hate about our world is that they'll they'll see something they don't agree with, even if it's like over. Like I do not like his DC movies. Like, and I've made that very public. I'm not a fan of Man of Steel or Batman vs Superman. But I like my days of fighting with people about it are long gone. Like I think in the beginning for a couple months. I got into arguments online when Man of Steel came out, and then after that, I stopped because I saw an interview with Zach where he said, in the interview, he said, I'm not here to, like, I'm making a Superman movie, yes, but I'm not here to translate the comic directly. I'm doing, like, an, a multiverse story, you know, because I can't do a direct translation of the comic, so I'm doing kind of my own thing with it. And, you know, and, and once he said that, and then I was working at Top Cow at the time, and my boss at Top Cow, Matt Hawkins, he had never liked Superman in his life. And Matt's been working in comics for like 20, 25 years. And he's like, I've never once liked Superman. Never in a comic, never in a movie, TV show, nothing. He goes, so when I saw Man of Steel, I liked that movie because it was the first time I liked Superman. And when I heard him say that and I heard Zach's interview, I, that, made, that made me shut my mouth because I said, look at what Zach did. He made a guy who never liked Superman before, he got him to like Superman. And, uh, and that to me made his movie way more interesting to me as far as uh you know what it, what kind of fandom it's pulled in and you guys have been loyal so it's 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 so nice to see the good that has been done the money that's been raised for charity because obviously zach went through you know a very heartbreaking uh, situation um and a, a tremendous loss uh, you know from his family and I, I can't imagine having the strength to still go on after that and yet the guy has found the strength you know probably through the love of his family and his fans all of you guys who helped him stay up after all this. He has a zombie movie coming out again called Army of the Dead, which I'm going to watch. I cannot wait. I'm so excited. And now he's got the the one, the big movie, the movie everyone wanted to see, and it's going to be this really long, epic thing. So, you know, are you are you going to call in sick to work, or are you going to, like, ask for a week of vacation off? Like, how, like how do you plan to watch the Snyder Cut? Huh. Well, I haven't thought that far ahead yet. But, <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, uh, I'm sure. I'm sure I'll, f I'll figure something out when the time comes. I'm sure you will. Um, and so, are you also just as a, a last side to this, and we'll we'll move on to something else. But uh, are you also pushing for the A year cut of Suicide Squad? Uh, yeah, uh, and actually, I was uh, um, on the 20th of July that they had the big. They had a big push for. Uh, the release day or cut just like they did for the release, of, release of Snyder Cut on November 17th and I uh, was very active uh, actively involved with that as well oh. and that, that, that was a lot of fun you know seeing different people with you know sharing their little fan edit videos and pictures you know tagging AT&T and HBO Max to you know get their attention and uh, I don't know how much of a difference it's, it made but uh, I guess time will tell a time will tell, I, you know, and it may take a year. It may they may want to see what the results are of the Snyder Cut before they make a decision on that. But um, I gotta say, the fan base is there too. It seems like all the Snyder fans are are definitely on the Ayer Cut board too, which is great. I mean, that's good for those filmmakers to finally get their vision, uh, you know, less tampered with out there, which is neat. I mean, I, to me, I understand the business side of things. I don't mind when movies are recut or re-edited by executives because that's just part of the process unless you work in your contract that you get final cut then you know which is very hard to do uh, especially when you're spending a, you know Warner Brothers money <laughs> and investors money it's very hard to get that in your contract but you know if you do that's great if you don't that's part of the business side so to me every version that comes out in the theater it's just like hey that's the version we get I got we got to live with it but it's neat to see a, a change like we know we've had the Richard Donner cut of spider or of Superman 2 we've had uh, the Spider-Man 3 editors cut for whatever reason I don't know why we got that but we got it anyway um, I still want a uh, Tim Pope cut of the Crow City of Angels uh, so there, there's so many things out there that it would be neat to live in the alternate world where these directors got their visions and it's neat that we now live in that alternate world at least with the Snyder cut so that's that's to me really awesome so you know, with with all the DC stuff said and us talked about that, like you mentioned Venom earlier, did you go see the Venom movie opening weekend? Uh, I didn't get to see it opening weekend. I think mm -hmm. I had to work uh, mm -hmm. that weekend, uh, but I did eventually get the the Blu-ray for it. Uh, 
sometime, I think it was like, like sometime in the summer of last year and finally got to watch it. And I mean, I, I enjoyed it. It's not 100%, you know, as they showed it in the original trailers, but I still <laughs> in, enjoyed it. And, um, but also I would have loved to have seen like a lot of stuff that Tom Hardy said that got cut from the movie because you know, Tom Hardy especially was, you know, the best part of the movie. Cause I mean, I love Tom Hardy in anything he does. Um, but his him as Eddie Brock and then the interactions with with the symbiote were my favorite parts of the of the movie and I wish we could have seen more of that. I definitely wish we could have too. I think for budget reasons, because the movie was under a hundred million, is is probably why some of that was cut. But um, but you're right. I mean, I think there there is a lot on the cutting room floor. According to Tom, maybe even forty minutes up to. And uh, so I, I was hoping this year when they push back the you know the second Venom movie, I was like, you know, it'd be a really cool announcement is if they said okay. The week the, sec- the, the week the second movie was going to come out in October of this year, since we're pushing the movie back to next year, in October we're going to release the Tom Hardy cut. <laughs> we're going to or at least rele- release a new version of the Blu-ray with all that cut footage in as bonus scenes. Like I think if they would have done that, they didn't even have to edit them in the movie. If they just put out a DVD with all that extra content uh, or Blu-ray, I would have been so happy. Like that that's something I would have done if I worked over at marketing, if I had the power to. But um. But yeah, I mean, there is a there is a part of me that would like to see Tom just you know unhinged because he did he brought Kelly Marcel in to kind of rewrite some of the script. They added a bunch of stuff to the movie. Uh, I feel like she gets very little credit for coming in and trying to make that uh, you know a more cohesive movie. Um, but yeah. she, but she should she should get a, I mean I know she gets credit at least from Sony on some level because and Tom because she's the sole writer of the second movie, which is great. Um, so you know, have, having seen Venom and stuff, and and you were just watching it last year, are there any? Uh, you know, I agree with you. I think the tone from the trailers to the movie were different, and I think there could have been more of that stuff added in. Are you hoping to get something darker with the sequel, or would you like to see something more akin to the stuff that Tom cut, which was probably more a little over the top, a little tongue in cheek? Well, I don't know about necessarily wanting it darker, but. Uh, with Andy Serkis being the, the director, I'm sure the tone will, will be slightly darker from the first film, mm-hmm. and and especially you know with the history and knowledge that uh, Andy Serkis has with motion capture, I'm sure the the visual uh, aspect of the film will uh, you know go up a few notches as well, and. And uh, with Woody Harrelson as Cletus Cassidy, that I'm very curious about that because he's another actor that I've always enjoyed, and he's you know he's kind of a chameleon with can, that can play almost any type of you know genre. But just you know seeing him in this kind of role, and I'm glad he's gonna have different hair than what he had in the in the uh, post credit scene from the first movie, like the as I always called it, the little orphan Annie wig from that one. <laughs> yeah, um, he he definitely looked like that for sure. Um, what is um. You know, like b- besides Venom, because I, I can, like, I could obviously I could talk to your head off about Venom all day too. But we can still talk about it. But I'm just curious. Besides, you know, wrestling, Snyder Cut. You know, the you, you see in the Venom movie, like, you know, I know things life gets in the way. But you since you mentioned it a few times, do you um not? But you know, I'm talking pre-pandemic because obviously right now none of us can go to the theaters. But do, do you work a lot? Is it is that why you have issues going out to theaters or getting there opening weekend? Is it mainly just work schedule or life stuff? Uh, it's it's kind of a mixture of both like you know work depending on like work hours because uh very few times that I'm, a- I'm able to actually see a movie like on opening day or like when the joker movie came out last year that was the only movie that i actually got saw opening night on thursday cool. uh yeah, and that was a last minute you know choice because i just looked up the show times for the weekend and saw like oh they have a showing at 4 30 4 30 tonight and i'm gonna i decided to go for it got a free poster for it that i have behind me on the wall as well so that was a, a fun experience and but yeah, mo- mo- most for most movies, especially the big movies, like like for for event for Infinity War and Endgame, those are the only two movies I ever pre-ordered the tickets a month ahead for opening day. <laughs> Smart. Um, I, I never did that for any other movie before that, and I don't know if I'm gonna do it uh, for any other movie going forward, depending on what the uh, I guess the scale of whatever future movies that comes out. Uh, like I I probably would have done it for Tenet, but that got pushed back also. So who knows what's gonna happen with that one. Um. But yeah, it's it's usually uh, either work or like sometimes like I would have like certain like health issues that get in the way. Like I have a a, a recurring a uh, pil- cyst that's like on the tailbone uh. area that that 
Uh, I haven't been able to get it surgically removed, so it's like it develops like every six months to almost every year, mm. and that's you know that's a very painful thing. And I have to, if I when I I get it drained out, I have to take like 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 half a week to recover. So that that tends to get in the way a lot. Jeez, well, I'm sorry to hear that, and I I know what it's like to have a an, a, a hardcore ailment pop up on you every six to twelve months for sure. Um, it it is not, it's your, and that sounds, God, that sounds so painful, man. I'm, I apologize that you're going through that. It's, uh, I, you know, it's, I notice this community when I get more and more involved in it, Uh, a lot of us have these, um, these things that, uh, that we don't ask for, but that, that somehow separate us from, from people sometimes. And it's, uh, it's heartbreaking because I feel like, uh, I feel like people like you and me and my friend Lonely Symbiote, I think a lot of us, we have more to offer the world, but because of these things, we, we kind of sometimes pull ourselves back because we have to, because it hurts or, you know, it, it, it hinders us in some way. And, you know, does that, do you find that you make a lot of friends in these communities that also have similar things going on or and 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 if so you know does that make you feel good knowing that you are part of a community that at least understands uh, maybe what you're going through yeah it it does feel you know pretty good to you know you know it's not not to to sound too cheesy but it feels good to know that i'm not alone yeah yeah sure i feel the same way um and if anyone calls us cheesy i'll kick you i'll kick you hard man (laughs) Uh, <laughs> um, but no, no, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Please, please go ahead. Oh no, no, it's fine. Um, uh, it's just it's like, I don't really find a lot of people that I can relate to on like certain le- on like certain levels with regards to like you know uh, essentially anything. It's very hard for me to uh, well, really, it's really hard for me to open up to almost anybody unless I really trust them. Mm-hmm. So like like even even doing this, uh, it's you know, you know like. Like I was saying to you before we we started recording that you know I've never done anything like this before, so it's uh, it's you know it takes a lot of a lot of mental strength for me to be able to open up like this, and even having my own channel that took a lot of mental strength as well, because up until recently I never showed my face, with the exception of a few like short news videos that I did when covering the 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 Sony and Marvel Spider Man stuff last summer. Uh, besides that, I, I never showed my face because I was always afraid to show myself, you know, publicly. But now, you know, with and over the last, I would say, four months, I've had I haven't had as much of a uh, fear of showing my face to on on camera when I do when I do my videos. That's so, good. I, I'm I'm glad yeah. to hear you you got through that too. Because I mean, I know a lot of YouTubers who don't show their face and some of it do they don't do it because of anonymity they like uh they talk about controversial things and they don't want their identity shown but to me like i've always like that was a big obstacle for me actually when i first started youtube i was like if my first video doesn't have my face in it i'm never going to make a video with my face in it so i i really try to get over that hump and i know what it's like like i mean first of all i appreciate you trusting me to come on the show and lonely too i think that was her first time she was on a podcast and a couple other people i think the same way who were on the parasite podcast and i know that feeling i remember the first time i was asked to go on a podcast it was by uh, it was of all people actually it was by dan Harmon. Um, who created the TV show's community, and he's a co-creator of Rick and Morty. Um, he was like, "Hey, I I have a podcast. You know, I'd love. To, you know, I was already v- attending as a fan, but he was like, "Could you? Would you come up and talk about your ailments?" And I'm like, "Oh, of all the things, like, can I come up and talk comics or you know something else?" And he was like, "He's like, well, we already have people on the show that kind of do that, uh, but I I'm interested in your uh, brain aneurysm and all that stuff. And would you come up?" And that was the hardest thing for me to say yes to was because I found out that per episode he had like a million listeners. And I'm just like, oh my God, I go, can I put myself out there like that? And I'm glad I did. And I think the taking that leap helped. And so you revealing yourself on camera, I think is great. You being here means a lot to me. I mean, I see your comments. You're, you're always positive. You're always very nice. You know, I've seen some of your YouTube content. And by the way, I, enc- I encourage anyone listening to this, you know, please go subscribe to the Men Tights podcast. I'll put the link to his channel down below to Julian's channel, you know, please go subscribe to him. Check out his stuff. If you're into wrestling, comics, all that stuff, like he's got a great channel. You clearly have a great personality. And I'm thankful that you are part of this community and that you shared yourself with me today and with everyone who's listening because, um, you know, it, it means the world. Like it's so it's so great hearing people get through that struggle of getting out of their shell. And so, um, you know, before we go, is there 
any last words you'd like to say to everyone? Any of the last things you want to plug? And, uh, and you know, any last comments? Because, uh, I mean, I could definitely talk to you all day, so I'll have you back on. But, uh, but I just, what you just said meant a lot to me, and I think that's a good note to end on. Uh, well, it's, it is an honor to be uh, part of this community and be part of the show. Um, um, the only thing I can really think of at the moment, because I, I know you, I know you, you know, you're big into video games. Also, I wanted to ask you: Have you, have you, have you played The Last of Us Part Two? I haven't even played the first one. Actually, I own the first one. I, I, I just bought the first one like two weeks, two three weeks ago, um, and I'm gonna get the second one here soon. So I have a friend who was nice enough to. Um, Help me uh, and contribute to the channel by giving me some games, and uh, he just gave me Ghost of Tsushima. Um, so I do want to play that, but before I, but I told him not to give me um, go, Last of Us Two until I played the first one. So I will try. I promise. Everyone keeps telling me I got to get into it, and I'm and I I'll get there. I promise. Yeah, uh, because hey, I was when I when I got my PS4 it was in 2015. I bought the uh, it was the Uncharted Nathan Drake Collection bundle. Mm -hmm. uh, because at the time my wife was working at Target and I used I used her discount to get that. Nice. And uh, and then but you know all my friends kept telling me you gotta you know get The Last of Us and for, they were telling me for about six or seven months however and then I finally got it and it was like okay I see why they wanted me to play it. <laughs> uh, that's how I feel. I mean that people have been trying to get me to play that game for years because I when I started my Twitch channel uh, like three years ago or four years ago I was just playing Resident Evil games and then I got into the Tomb Raider games and some of the other stuff and, and uh, Red Dead Redemption and so everyone was like dude you gotta play Last of Us and I've been putting it off this whole time so I now I own it but now that I ha of course I buy it two weeks before I get a new job so it's like <laughs> So I promise I'll play it. I promise you I'll play it. And when I do, I'll, I'll make sure to let you know that I'm live streaming it so you can come in and you can help me if I get stuck on any parts of the game. I'll be happy to help out with that. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, uh, Julian, I'll definitely have you back at some point down the road, uh, you know, for sure, so everyone can check up on you and, up, you know, get updates from you. But thank you for making time today, for, for taking this leap and trusting me, uh, you know, and trusting the show and the audience. You know, I, I, we, we love having you, man. I'm so glad you're part of this community. And, uh, you know, you know, keep doing what you do. Uh, keep making great content on your channel. And everyone, please go check it out uh, for me. Thank you very much. Like I said, happy to be here and uh, happy to, to say that, that you're a friend of mine as well. Awesome. Definitely, man. And uh, everyone, thanks for listening to the show. Go check out all of Julian's links in the description box below. His YouTube channel, his TeePublic channel. Uh, follow him on Twitter. You know, uh, Get to know this guy. He's really awesome. And uh, we'll definitely have more guests coming up soon. I'm going to have uh, actually the, one of the actors from the first Venom movie, Jared Bankins, will be on an upcoming episode. Um, and then we have some other guests that I'll be surprising you guys with, hopefully over the course of time. And I'll be looking in the comment section to find more guests for the show as well. So, you know, be like Julian here. Be a part of the community. And and when you stand out, I'll definitely reach out to you and try to get you on the show as well, as long as you're uh, over 18 and you're not too nervous. <laughs> um, so thank you very much, uh, you guys, uh, for watching the show. Like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And we'll see you in the future. Peace.